Greetings and uh, welcome to Change Now 2021. This is 30 Minutes with Mark Kearney. I'm Mark Stabule. I'm a professor of economics at INSEAD Business School. I'm the academic director of the James M. and Kathleen D. Stone Center for the Study of Wealth and Equality, also at INSEAD. INSEAD is the official academic partner at Change Now for the third year in a row, and we are proud to be here today, joining forces to accelerate change towards a more sustainable world. Earlier today, we heard from speakers who talked about impact investment, the importance of leadership, uh, investors' role to change companies, and all of this points to the importance of systemic change, the systemic change that the world needs. So now, on to tonight's event. I'm honored to be joined uh, today by Mark Carney, the UN Special Envoy for Climate Action and Finance and Prime Minister Johnson's Finance Advisor for COP26. Mark was, of course, previously Governor of the Bank of England from 2013 to 2020 and Governor of the Bank of Canada from 2008 to 2013. And tonight, to close the day, uh, he is going to talk with us about how we can accelerate the transition to a more sustainable financial system. And Mark, I hope that you are there because it's over to you. Welcome, it's nice to see you again. And uh, <laughs> welcome to Change Now. Okay, thank you very much, Mark, and thanks everyone for uh, tuning in this evening. Um, I have to say, Mark, I look look longingly through your um, through your window there, out I presume onto Fontainebleau, and I hope uh, hope things are returning to normal there. Look, I, I I think what would be useful maybe if I spend ten minutes max um, saying what we are doing. Uh, for that type of system change that you just referenced, system change in the financial system. Uh, and uh, what I'm speaking specifically about is the strategy for COP26. And uh, to be clear, the system change we're seeking is to be in a position where that every financial decision takes climate change into account. Uh, and what does that mean? That means that climate change is as much a determinant of value as uh, interest rates are or credit risk or technology uh, shifts. Uh, now, what that follows, what follows from that is putting in place uh, some pillars, some plumbing uh, for the system, but also getting commitments uh, from the entities themselves. So we sort of need information, we need tools, and we need new markets uh, to go alongside those commitments. The bedrock of this uh, is information. I mean, that's it's no great insight. It's hard, easier to say, harder to do, uh, and the. Uh, the, that is around uh, Task Force for Climate Rated Financial Disclosure. Uh, and the core of that, the or the objective with it, is in order to um, uh, use that uh, as the basis for disclosure in all jurisdictions. And uh, five years ago, uh, not far from Fontainebleau, we were in Paris five and a half years ago, uh, and an idea was formed, which was to have the private sector come up with the type of disclosure that both the suppliers and users of capital would need in order to manage climate risk. That was the TCFD. Now the effort is to uh, take all that good work by the private sector. It's got tremendous momentum but make sure that it's comprehensive and uh, universally applied. Uh, so we have legislation in Europe uh, working its way through with the, some, the CSRD is ultimately the, uh, the sustainability uh, directive. It's much more than climate, but at its heart is uh, climate. We have legislation in the UK, a commitment to legislate TCFD disclosure for all companies, not just large ones. By 2025, we have the securities regulators saying comply or explain in places like Japan. And very importantly, we have uh, the body that oversees financial disclosure in 140 countries, uh, basically everywhere but the U.S. Uh, it's called the IFRS. Um, it is now or it's on the process to develop sustainability disclosures. Uh, and the first element of that would be TCFD disclosure. Uh, and then we would build off of that. Uh, so that's um, that's well in trade, getting that information in place. It will make a huge difference uh, in order to uh, uh, to help put the components there so that we're taking climate change into account. Um, banks uh, need to be better at risk management, not just uh, physical risk, but very importantly, transition risks. And, you know, Sometimes economists are viewed as the dismal science. Uh, you should meet people who manage risk at uh, uh, financial institutions. Uh, their job is to think about what uh, can go wrong. And what can go wrong in climate, in some respects, is success is failure. The more progress we make in terms of the transition to net zero, uh, the more that some industries, uh, some companies certainly, but some industries, some whole industries, uh, become stranded, uh, become uneconomic. Uh, and uh, the most obvious that is in and around fossil fuels, uh, but it extends more broadly in the economy. So we need banks need the tools to pull the future to the present to think about 
what if what if the type of climate policies tomorrow that are required tomorrow are applied today? How would my lending book look, and what should I do about it? So that's the second pillar. Um, I'll skip over the third pillar, which is around what asset managers and owners and others do, because I'm going to finish with that. But let me highlight a couple of missing markets that are being developed. Uh, one is for carbon offsets, and carbon offsets are um, uh, largely, but not exclusively, nature-based. Um, they're largely uh, resident or developed in uh, emerging and developing economies, uh, and the demand for those will largely come from companies in advanced economies. Uh, the challenge right now is that that market is relatively fragmented. It's not that professional. It's not as professional as other markets. It doesn't have independent verification and oversight. And so all of those elements are being addressed at present through something called the Winters uh, uh, Task Force. Uh, over 450 organizations are developing uh, the answers here. And we want to have a pilot market up and running by Glasgow and then for it to extend beyond. Um, now, we're not going to get to net zero uh, without massive, massive investment everywhere, but particularly in emerging and developing world. Um, and Part of the solution for that is going to come from what's called blended finance. In other words, combinations of public finance, particularly from the multilateral development banks and development finance institutions, taking away some of the risks and then private finance taking on the commercial risk. So we need to build that at scale uh, and work is underway under the Italian G20 presidency to do just that. Now, let me finish and then we'll, we'll have a discussion and be able to uh, try to answer uh, some of the questions. Um, the, um, I said at the outset that we need commitments. Um, uh, we need uh, leaders in the financial sector. In fact, we need the mainstream of the financial sector to be managing their balance sheets towards net zero. Um, and we started to make a breakthrough on that. Uh, a year ago, two years ago, certainly, the issue was about managing risk. This was um, being concerned about the downside, the more extreme uh, circumstances related to climate change, whether it's on physical risk or the transition risk that I just spoke about. But now it's shifting into seizing those opportunities, recognizing that there is tremendous uh, commercial return to be made by backing companies that are part of the solution uh, and avoiding those that are part of the problem. Um, and the, what we have done, and this was, I'll finish on this, Mark, and then we can discuss, is for President Biden's summit uh, a month, last month uh, was to bring together the leaders uh, across the financial system, whether they were pension funds or insurance companies, asset managers um, or banks, and have very specific commitments to net zero strategies, uh, not just for 2050, but fair share to 2030, and then even more specifically, strategies, a commitment to have strategies by sector out over the course of the next few years. Now, this all sounds, all of this, I'm sure, thus far has sounded a bit abstract. It's important. Uh, but let me leave with a number, which is when you total up those companies that came together for President Biden's summit, they control balance sheets of $70 trillion. Uh, and that's just the start. That's an enormous number, um, even bigger number in Canadian dollars, if I want to make it sound like more. Uh, but it's an enormous number. And it gives a sense, and I'll finish on this, of the type of system change that's underway. Uh, now, more to be done. I've got to get it over the finish line. Uh, but there is tremendous momentum. And uh, I, I look forward to uh, discussing it with you. Okay, that's super. Thanks for the introduction. I think, I think I'll pick up right where you left off. And just because lots of people here are not finance people, right? So, so as you said, April 21, just last month, you co-launched this Net Zero Financial Alliance. You have some of the biggest banks, asset owners, insurers, and uh, you're bringing together 160 plus firms that, as you said, are responsible in excess of 70 trillion, right? So for those of us in the audience who are not, right, can you, can you just go back a step and explain why a financial alliance like this is such a big step. And what does it let us do that we couldn't do before? And and what, if it does, does it force uh, others to do as part of it? Yeah, so it, it, does, it does several things. Um, the first is it changes the mindset of those financial institutions that are in, and I would argue those who are on the outside as well, uh, because it's saying a very clear commitment that I want to ensure that I'm backing companies that are reducing their emissions, okay? And uh, I'll be very clear what I just said, which is it doesn't necessarily mean I'm backing 
uh, only green power or only companies in the circular economy. It means that I am going and finding companies that have a plan themselves, a plan towards net zero, um, and I'm going to invest in them or I'm going to lend to them or some combination of that so they can move from where they are today to where they're going tomorrow, okay, or where, where they need to get to, where we all need them uh, to get to. And that's very important. What we need to wrap around, first, you need that commitment and that mindset uh, that is uh, providing money, basically, for the solutions. Now, it's very important and, you, you know, they're not everybody is uh, to their credit. Uh, not everybody is down in the weeds of finance and um, uh, and spending all their time uh, on these issues uh, because there's there's many more important things to do, uh, obviously, um, and more interesting things to do. But I think everybody or virtually everybody expects that if a company and a particular financial institution says that it is on a transition to net zero, that, that that is true. That's not greenwashing. That's not just fancy words out of the PR department or it's doing a bit over here, but lots of bad things on, on the other side. Um, and so what an alliance like this Glasgow uh, Financial Alliance for Net Zero does is first and foremost, uh, it provides a gold standard. It, 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 you, not just anybody can get into it uh, and not just anybody can stay in it once you're in. Uh, so there's transparency about the plans, transparency about the actual emissions, there's clear tracking uh, and, and all of that. And so we can, as stakeholders, if I talk about it, and, and I think in the spirit of the work you're doing, uh, as broader stakeholders, we can make those judgments. The second thing it does, it does two other things. One is it makes sure that the system, and again, you started on, rightly on system change, that the system is supportive. Um, and so what does that mean? It means some of getting to net zero requires some new markets like that market for blended finance for investment in uh, emerging and developing economies. Well, these financial institutions have now a very strong incentive to invest in those markets. Um, and if there's something that's holding them back from doing it, uh, they could collectively can help us on the public side, if you will, uh, to develop those in order for it to be the case. Same thing with this uh, carbon offset market, same thing in other examples in the plumbing of the system. Plumbing is more important than it sounds. Um, you know, you know it when you don't have it, when it's not working. It's the same for uh, finance, if that's not the case. Um, and the third thing that it does is I think it provides um, one one input to government policy. Uh, and I'll, I'll finish with this, which is that one of the big lessons of finance, when finance is working well, one of the big lessons of finance is that it pulls forward adjustment. Um, now it is much, much more likely to do that if government policy is credible and predictable. Uh, it's a point Janet Yellen and I uh, made, uh, been making over the course of the last year. Um, and Examples of that include, I'm joining you from Canada, as you may know, um, and Canada has a legislated price for carbon out to 2030. It rises from about $30 today, Canadian, to about $170, well, to $270 by 2030. Now, I can invest today predictably based on that because it's in legislation. I would say there's an analogy to um, the... Uh, moratoria on internal combustion engines, for example, in Germany, in the UK, other European countries, uh, to hydrogen fuel blends uh, that are that are being required as part of the European uh, Recovery Fund, other other examples. And those those clear policies in the future um, can can combine with finance and pull forward adjustment. And my point being that that's part of what a table albeit a big and very expensive table like uh, the Glasgow Alliance with its $70 billion, it, it, it can make, help make that point to governments and encourage the kind of po climate policies that we need because the governments see actually there's money on the side that's going to be put to work and we are going to benefit from that. It's not just a cost that we're putting in place. In fact, the cost actually becomes a big investment uh, and part of the solution. That sounds, uh, okay, I, I think... I mean, it sounds to me like there's an additional benefit. I just want to ask you about it, which is, you know, once you get all these financial players and lots of dough engaged in this, you you would have a much harder time if you were trying to make the argument, oh, this 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 strategy or this this movement is is fringe. It's not actually mainstream, and and that those who say that you know the the return from investing 
in 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 clean investments, right, uh, might be too low compared to normal returns. Well, when when all of this is this machinery is starting to move that way, does it take those arguments off the table in a way that maybe politicians can't? Yeah, it's uh, it's a great question, um, and I, what I would say, Mark, is that you know. Three years. Well, the last time you and I saw each other, actually saw each other, uh, uh, other than uh, virtually, uh, it was fringe. Uh, it was an important bit of the fringe, uh, but climate ESG investing. It was it was focused into niches, into green niches, very important niches. But it wasn't. Uh, you know, climate change was not always taken into account uh, in terms of financial decisions. Uh, what's happened in really uh, the last couple of years, and it's accelerated uh, over the course of the last 12 months, uh, has been this movement into the mainstream. Uh, you know, there still are dedicated ESG funds, there still are um, uh, specific uh, sustainability products, and, there, and there's a lot of value in that. But also, this is about whole balance sheets. Um, now, now it's becoming uh, about whole balance sheets of financial institutions and looking at that balance sheet as a whole uh, and saying, well, it's not just about my fund over here that's accelerating um, the transition. But wait a minute, I make all these loans over here, or investments over here. How are they going to be affected by the transition? Are they going to be winners or losers? And what can I do to make sure there's more winners than losers? Uh, and so that's really what shifted. And and that is Again, and that's part of the message into policymakers uh, is that uh, you know those who are making climate policy or energy policy uh, is that the scale of capital that uh, could be available is quite enormous. Now, the last thing I will say uh, before I, I sound too um, uh, optimistic or Pollyannish about the financial sector, you know, there there, there are two quite daunting elements here. One is that we've left it very late um, to have this shift. Um, and secondly, and relatedly, the orders of magnitude of the investment required are, are enormous. And, you know, I, I'm not saying it's precisely right, it's a scenario, but the IEA scenario of uh, last week uh, had a doubling of uh, energy investment um, uh, in order to have a one and a half degree world and uh, orders of magnitude of $5 trillion a year, more than doubling, in fact, since uh, I think the most recent year is about two and a quarter, two and a half, two and a quarter uh, trillion uh, in energy investment. So uh, it's moved from the fringes to the mainstream, uh, but it really needs to be in the mainstream. Uh, and, uh, and, and we need to keep it there and, and, and even there uh, amplify it. So, so uh, thank you. I mean, I had the benefit of listening to your BBC lectures, which were amazing. Thank you. Uh, if you haven't heard them, I would recommend that you go and listen to them, those of you on, who are listening. Um, in there, you, you mentioned that despite all of this, right, we, we actually, and maybe this is some of what's happening at COP26, we actually are quite a ways off uh, in terms of what the alignment of the current financial system is on the path to net zero, or, or how countries are doing in terms of their uh, Paris commitments and the path to net zero. I mean, is this, how is this going? Is this just, you know, I don't know, don't know the people who are aware yeah. of how far off we might be. So let's, um, let's the good news, bad news out of Paris. Um, uh, three innovations of uh, the Paris Accord. One is com countries show up with their, their best efforts, their so-called NDCs or uh, company, country plans. So, you know, showed up five years ago, five and a half years ago and said, this is what we're going to try to do. The second innovation of Paris was to add those plans up and objectively say, this is what, if everyone does what they say they're gonna do, this is where the world's gonna end up in 2100. And the objective view was we're gonna end up at 2.6 degrees. And so right out of the gate at Paris, there was this uh, discrepancy, which is, wait a minute, the objective of Paris was less than two and stretched to one and a half, but what everyone showed up with was 2.6. And that discrepancy only grew with time because guess what? Not everybody did what they said they were going to do. And, uh, and you know, maybe there were some other feedback loops as well in the climate, but we're on a path uh, most recently above three degrees by 2100. So we're quite far away. Now, part of the genius, uh, and, I, and I do use that where I have full respect to those um, uh, who uh, developed and worked so hard for it, uh, Paris is we know the gap or we know we have a good estimate of the gap. And so that has been in the last few years, pressure on countries, companies, financial system as well to say, well, 
look, that's not what the world wants. The world, uh, we, we, want, we want one and a half degrees. We want sustainability. And, and, and actually, that desire for sustainability has only grown since Paris. It's only mainstream, more in popular opinion and understanding. And, you know, as I would sometimes say to uh, uh, the CEOs, you know, it's, a, it's slightly embarrassing that we need a 16-year-old uh, Swedish uh, 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 student to uh, point out what the carbon budget is and how far we are, off we are. But that's, you know, one of Greta Thunberg's uh, contributions was that. So, so where are we and where are we since I, I gave those lectures, which was back in November, um, there has been a lot more movement uh, by some of the major countries. Uh, Europe uh, has uh, reinforced uh, their efforts. The UK has increased its objectives six to 68 percent. Japan increased with the Biden um, at the Biden administration to just under 50 percent, 45 with a stretch to 50. Canada increased from 30 to 40 to 45, uh, that range. Uh, a series of other measures, not the final word, from some major emerging economies as well. And what was interesting with the IEA's um, uh, scenarios that came out last week, two things. One, that three degrees uh, in terms of policies, because countries have been doing new policies, their judgment is that if everyone does so-called stated policies, what they've said they're going to do on the policy side, we'll end up at 2.6. So we clawed it back to where we were in Paris. That's something. Um, it's contingent on countries doing what they say. But they also said that for countries, what they've committed to do, the time paths for reducing emissions and ultimately getting to net zero, if they meet those time paths, will it be at 2.1 degrees? So we're starting to get within sight of what we want in Paris. We're not there, but we're within sight. And last point, which goes to what we were talking about a few moments ago, which is this relationship between credibility and predictable policy. Now, if I think my government is serious and I'm going to hold their feet to the fire about the climate policy, then, and, I, and let's say I'm running a company as well, um, and I think that we're on the path to 2.6 globally on current stated policies, but government says we're going to get to 2.1. So that tells me more, there's more to come on climate policy. And I maybe I should get ahead of that or invest in a way that's going to be consistent with right. that. That's the virtuous right. circle that we'd like to be in. And by the way, if we get to 2.1, it also tells me there's more and more to come because we're supposed to be sub two. Uh, and that's the, you know, that's the dynamic we want for uh, the negotiations uh, and the and the efforts for Glasgow and uh, Glasgow and beyond. Okay. Great. That's good. I mean, uh, okay. I'd like to, um, I'd like to ask you a couple of inequality questions, if I could. Um, inequality and climate questions, not changing, not changing topic altogether. So, uh, you know, if you, if you go to the COP26 website, there there are tabs there that speak to mitigation and adaptation, and and countries and industries are putting out some plans for some, as you said, some serious mitigation and adaptation to reach these goals, right, over a relatively short time span. So, I mean, this is. Um, this is a question then, I guess, about within countries. I, I want to talk about between countries too, but within countries, you know, how are you addressing this, this set of mitigation adaptation plans? And, and should we be worried about the distributional aspects of mitigations within nations, right? I mean, are, are, are we going to put a lot of undue burden on, on those who can least afford to pay it? Uh, first thing, absolutely, we should be worried. Anytime, and you know this well, uh, anytime we have a big structural change, something that affects multiple industries, multiple regions, uh, you one has to worry about inequality. Some are just better placed, uh, either because they have more flexible skills or they have capital. Uh, they can take advantage of those structural changes. Um, and both of those push in the direction of uh, inequalities. You have sort of natural winners and losers uh, from the structural change, whether it's the advent of art artificial intelligence, or it is uh, moves towards sustainability. Uh, and, you know, interestingly, or, or slightly concerningly, we're having both of those happen at the same time in situations where we have moved to relatively high levels of inequality, certainly wealth inequalities in many of our societies. And we have these drivers that are likely to lead to more inequality. So we absolutely have to be concerned about it, um, almost obsessed by it, I would suggest, uh, because you know, with structural forces, we need to lean against those structural forces uh, in order to uh, make sure that uh, 
as many as citizens are benefiting as possible from the structural change and that we are compensating those uh, those that don't. And so these are fundamental uh, multifaceted questions. Now, in terms of climate, I think that uh, the better news is that a number of the technologies and a number of things we need to do are actually relatively job heavy and can be spread quite broadly across geographies. So, I mean, the classic one, and everybody's now focused on it, uh, rightly so, is around improving uh, emission standards in buildings, home retrofits. I mean, it's construction heavy, it's every building, it's everywhere, um, and uh, very job very job intensive. Uh, in general, uh, the renewable power process is more job intensive than uh, traditional job, uh, you know, uh, uh, building road type uh, infrastructure. Uh, so that has its attractions as well. But that said, particularly in um, countries that uh, have heavy emissions, fossil fuel industries, large hard, hard to abate sectors like steel, um, other industrial processes, uh, there is going to need to be quite heavy investment in order to grow those uh, jobs in the future. And, uh, and uh, it's, um, I think that recognition is only, is, is only beginning to sink in. Okay. And, and let, me, let me then also turn to the other obvious inequality that, that I know lots of people are worried about, which is that, that um, you know, the poorest part of the world are likely to be hardest hit by, by uh, yeah. they have the fewest global emissions and they're likely to be hardest hit. The richest part of the world has the most emissions and, and, and will likely be able to cope better. Um, what in all of the stuff that, that we are thinking about can we reasonably expect to help developing countries uh, versus developed countries as we, as we move forward? Yeah, so you're absolutely right uh, on both of those points. Um, and, um, I, and the first is to say that uh, on the financing side, uh, there are a number of things in place. Uh, I think we can question whether they're on the uh, they're large enough for the scale of the challenge. And I think the answer is no, not yet. Um, the first is um, agreed in Copenhagen, um, but not yet fulfilled, is that uh, the rich countries, the advanced economies, are to uh, uh, transfer uh, or cause to transfer $100 billion a year to the emerging developing economies. Um, uh, the, the most recent assessment of those numbers was something on the order of 72, 73 billion. So there's a gap. And one of the priorities for the UK as called president uh, is to make sure that gap is closed. And I, I would say that that's almost immediately relevant because it'll be one of the discussion points at the G7 uh, next month in Cornwall. Um, so that's 100 billion. That's you know, that's something, but it's 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 not enough. Uh, the next is uh, the carbon offset market I talked about. That happens to be a market that is probably 80 to 100 billion euros a year if we get it right, and 75 to 90 percent of those pro uh, projects will be in the emerging world, uh, emerging developing world. So and and all the demand, virtually all the demand, will come from companies in the advanced world. So again, that's another transfer. I think the third thing is that. Uh, I, I talked at the start about net zero plans and, um, you know, it's about companies having uh, as broad responsibility as possible uh, and as appropriate uh, for their emissions. So uh, it's not about outsourcing your emissions to some supplier and then, you know, hands off. Um, so so-called scope three emissions being taken in to account as well. And then that alignment of incentive and the investment, and again, many cases that's in the emerging developing world. Um, I think the third or the fourth thing that we're looking to do uh, is working with the insurance industry around resilience, uh, because as you rightly said, you know the biggest impacts, the poles, the equator uh, regions, uh, are, are very much uh, developing countries, small island states, biggest impacts of actual climate change today, and uh, unfortunately, uh, going to get worse tomorrow. So, how do we um, how do we build? You know, where is where is that risk, and how do we concentrate investment um, in order to, you know, have higher seawalls, have, have more resilient uh, electricity infrastructure, actually uh, to have humanitarian aid when it's required. Um, and so the insurance industry is banding together, global insurance industry is banding together and developing something called, uh, and the, the headline is called the GRI, the Global Resilience Index, but really it's a series of metrics and a way of mapping the world and assessing where the biggest uh, risks and impact are of climate. So, and and that will help direct 
I mean, you can do some of it will be for insurance coverage of this, and so countries will get money when the bad things happen. But more importantly, it's about uh, directing investment and particularly development finance and aid to those most vulnerable states in, in a way that is uh, comprehensive and as uh, effective and fair as possible. Uh, so it's a massive, massive issue. And I would say, you know, if I were to summarize, uh, it's we're really only beginning to address it. Um, whereas that mainstreaming that's happened in the last few years that I started uh, with is largely advanced economy focused. Uh, and that's where most of the emissions are. But uh, there, there is a huge uh, additional amount of work to be done. Okay, thanks so much. So 30 minutes with Mark Carney goes very quickly. Uh, and that, so we have, we have reached our 30 minute mark. So what do I wanna, I wanna thank you. Thank you for uh, spending this time with us. And, and let me give a quick shout out for your new book, Values, which came out this year and, and uh, which is getting great reviews. So those of you who want to continue the conversation with Mark, uh, pick up the book and, uh, and there's lots there to dig into. Thank you so much, Mark, for joining us. And I hope that I'll see you, hopefully I'll see you in Canada sometime soon, but, but that we'll see each other soon live. One way or another. Yes, thank you very much, Mark, a real pleasure. And thank you all for uh, tuning in.